What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Absolute Strength Podcast. I have my boy Maddie Fusaro on. What's going on, man? What's up, man, dude? Thanks for having me on here, dude. It's been it's been a, a long time coming. We've been going at this for like uh, a week or two, trying to get uh, our schedules aligned. Yeah, crazy schedules back and forth, dude. It's so funny when you reached out to me because I was thinking back. I want to say it was like five years ago to where we first started talking. I think I yeah. came across an old Facebook message because not many people use Facebook Messenger yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah, so when no you hit does. me up on there, I was looking back on some of the old messages and how I was asking you about coaching years mm-hmm. and years ago because you were one of the first ones to really do it in this space. Yeah, I mean, actually when I had uh, Lane Norton on the podcast, we were talking about that on how uh, he was one of like the, the first people to do it from like a bodybuilding specific uh, bodybuilding coaching. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I don't know what, what year he started, but I remember I started started online coaching right around 2010 which in this space was one of the first people like there wasn't a lot of people that were already doing coaching outside of just competition prep coaching I'm talking like you know just your general uh, general average Joe coaching but then doing like some powerlifting some strength coaching and just kind of doing uh, an all-encompassing online coaching program so yeah dude but it was funny you said that because I actually was looking at the old messages too because I mean I hardly ever use Facebook messenger so mm-hmm. uh Yeah, it was kind of interesting going back and seeing what we were talking about. Yeah, it's crazy. And you just mentioned around 2010. So you're looking over seven years ago and still to this day, online coaching is a very new thing. Yeah, it is. So to know that you were doing it that long ago and actually, I mean, documenting it because you were helping Nick Wright out with his preps. And this was like when YouTube fitness actually first started too. Yeah. So it started, I think you started the trend of taking people off of going to websites and just typing in like meal plan for 2000 calories and like actually showing people the process of how you work with an individual based on what they need to do and what goals they need to achieve. Yeah. What's funny is when, when Nick and I started working together and we were doing macro coaching and actual like a flexible dieting approach, like the, like the feedback we were getting was like really bad. It was crazy. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. And now it's considered, I mean, if you don't use a flexible approach, it's, I mean, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's another thing that's still, I think a lot of people just don't understand. They hear flexible dieting and it's you know, nine o'clock at night and they look at their MyFitnessPal and it's, what can I fit into these numbers? Mm-hmm. And you start eating like, all right, well, the only thing that fits into these numbers is six almonds, a protein shake. And you know what I mean? It just yep. doesn't. So it's still something that I think people need to be educated on, but it's amazing how far it has come and how many people have dealt with, I guess you could say like unhealthy relationships with food because they tried to be too flexible sometimes or not flexible enough and they couldn't find that balance. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing with with flexible dieting. And I think initially when it first got popular, it was pretty much just, hey, how flexible can we be and still hit our numbers or how flexible can we be and still hit our, our progress goals? Whereas that, I mean, that's not really the way you should go about it. And, um, and I think it's kind of shifted back towards, at least with clients that I work with, and I don't know, you can probably uh, comment with your own clients, but it's almost shifted back towards, hey, listen, we're going to go the complete opposite direction. How, how good can we eat yep. and still hit our goals, but still hit our, our consistency goals and, and keep you on the diet for as long as possible? And what that will require is, you know, hey, a couple nights a week, hey, you are going to be a little bit more flexible when the time comes. You can be flexible, but the diet is not set up to the fact where, hey, let's just be as flexible as possible. That's not the way we do it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that was (laughs) – that's funny. I mean my clients completely understand because I let them know from the first consultation that you know we're going to make this a part of your lifestyle. We're going to have fun doing it. It's going to be challenging, but it's not a game of – what can we fit into our, you know what I mean? I think it's important to set that precedent too when you get started because sometimes people will hire you because they know that that's the approach that you take, that flexible approach. So they think they can get away with a lot more by working with you as opposed to working with someone who might be considered more bro. Yeah. I'm the first person to admit like, I eat like mostly bro and I think most people do and they're afraid to admit it because they're worried about being judged for it. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, or I guess even recently, people are still worried about not being flexible enough like oh you eat 90 percent clean that's boring you you know you're a bro like who cares you know this is how i enjoy eating and then some other people will post all the pictures of pop tarts and ice cream and cookies and like this is how i get shredded and i show their abs and it's like but dude you don't eat like that all the time i mean maybe you do but the majority of people are only going to show the fun foods (laughs) yeah i'm like dude that's so 2013 yeah exactly. (laughs) people are really worried about getting judged for the foods they eat yeah Well, well, like I, uh, I always post on, uh, well, 
I don't really use Snapchat that much anymore, but Instagram stories, I guess, is I like to post my breakfast because it's the same pretty much every day. About 95% of the time I eat eggs, a mixture of eggs, egg whites, oatmeal, and then some type of fruit. That's like mm -hmm. my breakfast every single day. And one thing about my breakfast that's that it's kind of like – that goes under the radar for I think most people is the fact that I like to keep it consistent not only because I enjoy those foods and they, they fit into my macros well and they set my day up well but just the act of not having to think about anything in the morning mm -hmm. is huge for me yep yeah, yeah I, th I think that a lot of people are also scared to admit that they cook in bulk or they meal prep like yep. you don't have to label yourself as a clean eater or a bro just to set yourself up for reaching your goals yeah like I don't think people get that. It's all about trying to come up with the newest creation every morning or every night for dinner. They're thinking, oh, what can I do to make this different? When really, if you were just consistent for a little while, you'd be hitting your goals a lot faster. Yeah. Well, consistency is huge. I actually was on a coaching call the other day. I think it was yesterday. And uh, the thing, the, the common theme that just kept coming up was consistency, consistency. So pretty mm -hmm. much everything we do can get boiled down into that one word, consistency. What can we do from a training perspective? What can we do from a nutrition perspective to allow the client to be as consistent as possible. And that's really mm -hmm. what flexible dieting was all about in the beginning. Because, I mean, think about it. A, a clean, we'll say bro approach, a, a meal mm -hmm. plan, works great if you can stick to it. But how mm -hmm. long can you actually stick to that? It's not sustainable. So that's yeah. when flexible dieting really got popular because it's like, okay, well, if we're tracking everything and we're fitting in foods that we actually enjoy, we can stick to them longer. But if you're super, super flexible, the consistency factor kind of – runs against you because it's really yeah. hard to be consistent when you're eating a hundred different things. Mm -hmm. And and that's, I believe our job as a coach is to actually educate people on that. Yeah. But the problem is that people who don't work with us one-on-one -on -one with the coaching, they listen to everyone else out there who's telling them they can eat whatever they want. Yep. You know, yep. so. So let's take a step back. When did you first get involved in fitness? Working oh out in general. <laughs> so. I guess real quick rundown memory lane. Yeah. I was uh, the overweight, insecure, self-conscious kid growing yeah. up, up until all throughout high school, really. Mm -hmm. I was the kid who wore a hoodie in the pool. I just, I never, hoodie I always wore, <laughs> not, not a hoodie, oh. a t-shirt in the pool. Um, I, I, yeah, I wore clothes in the pool. <laughs> but I would wear a hoodie every single day of the week because it was the only thing I was comfortable in. So like that was, was mm -hmm. hanging in my closet. A whole bunch of hoodies, never really wore t-shirts out. Just, just not happy with my, my self-image. I was again, very insecure. Mm -hmm. But I was always like the kind of person who I was very active. I got along with everyone. No one really bullied me much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people made fun of me here and there. But yeah. uh, growing up, I was always an athlete, but I also loved food. So it was kind of hard to like balance the two mm -hmm. out. So I played sports my entire life. And I had two older brothers who I was somewhat competitive with at times. And they never dealt with being overweight. They were into the gym, but not like how we are now. Yeah. They would just go lift from time to time. So I went with them a few times. And then I realized, I want to say I was... 17 years old. So going going into about senior year, I was so fed up with how I looked and how I felt. But at that time, God, we're really dating ourselves now. Mm -hmm. I saw it's 2004. None of this was really around. I mean, YouTube fitness wasn't a thing. Your information came from either a magazine that you picked up at 7-Eleven yep. or some article that you read online. And that was our knowledge. I mean, that's when even P90X was like, it wasn't weird to do something like that. Like that's what people... So I was the kind of person who would just run and do tons of cardio and throw a sauna suit on and google should i take creatine i knew nothing yeah well i lost a ton of weight but i also had no muscle on me so i ended up in the whole skinny fat category and then i realized like this is going to take time like not, not only like six months not like a year like years of consistency again that word comes back yeah it's gonna take years of putting in work if i want to actually be proud of how i look and how i feel so i guess you know, senior year came about, I did a little bit of lifting in college. I did some here and there. And then really, I would say within the last four or five years was when I really kind of stepped it up and educated myself more on nutrition, more on lifting and yeah, and got, it, got really. Involved. Um, yeah. so when you were in high school, so senior year, that was when you first got into to fitness. What was, what was the type of resources that you were looking at? You mentioned like the magazines and stuff. Cause I remember when I was in high school, that's what that's what I was looking at, like Flex Magazine, Muscle and Fitness, and uh, that's what the information I was getting. So about the same? Yeah, yeah, that that's exactly what it was. It was either that or, believe it or not, it was people who looked better than me. In yes, the gym. yes. And, and it, it might have been even people that I went to that I went to high school with, so maybe other mm -hmm. seniors that just looked better or people that were a year ahead of me who I would see in the gym 
this is what god we're dating ourselves man but this is when aol instant messenger was oh, yep. <laughs> so i was on aim sending messages to people like first like just asking everything about i i didn't know like should i have protein before i go to bed the same question we get now and we think to ourselves do people really not know this but you can't think like that like, yeah there is always a beginner out there who knows nothing so I'm always open to helping as many people as possible because I've been there before. Well, Although there's a lot more available information now, mm -hmm. people don't know where to go for the right information. Well, you know, and that's kind of like a – it's an important point because – and I was talking about this the other day as well with a client in that when you look at the landscape today, like when we were first getting into fitness, like and, that, and that's the reason why I asked you about what your resources were because none of this was going on. You didn't, mm -hmm. you didn't have – YouTube, you didn't have, I mean, there was YouTube in like, what, 2006, but there wasn't fitness yeah. in YouTube. There wasn't a million articles about every topic. And, uh, you didn't, I mean, it was hard to actually find useful information. And now we have almost the opposite where you can find the information relatively easy. It's just what's good information. Yeah, so that's one fun. thing that like with me, I mean, it's very easy to, to kind of think in your head. It's like, all right, well, everything's already been written about. Everything had a video about it. Why should I do it too? And we almost owe it to the people who do follow us and just everybody in general to put out that same information because you know what? Maybe maybe someone found yours first and you, we know that we're actually putting out good information. So I'd rather them find it from me than find the same thing from somebody else but have it bad information, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing with – Anyone who's involved in fitness nowadays, especially if they're trying to make a career out of it, whether that be mm -hmm. with coaching, personal training, or even on YouTube, is that people are scared to put out that beginner information because they're going to get called out for not coming up with anything revolutionary. Mm -hmm. But if I have a new client who's a beginner and I want to reference them to something, I'm going to send them to my video, not yep. someone else's, because I know that I did the research and I learned the information. And I think that's – the other important thing is to also – if you're someone who's on YouTube or you're a blogger – Look back five years, and if you wrote a post about creatine or about macros, and there was some wrong information, and it's still up there, then come up with you know write something new or create mm -hmm. something new that's that's up to date. And, oh yeah, and that's why I still to this day I make videos about how you actually set up your macros, and people are like it's been done before, you've done it before, fifty other people did this. I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, but I'm still learning every single day, so I'm gonna put out the best information on this topic. And you saw the title, you know what it's about. Mm -hmm. So if you feel confident in this and you know it, then move on, skip it, you know? Yeah, well, and, and that's an important point too because I think a lot of times people like us and, and content creators, we don't necessarily put out content for the people who are who need it and who are looking for it. We put out content for ourselves, for other coaches, you know what I mean? We try to impress everybody, which yeah. at the, when we were talking about this before we even got started, people like us, we don't necessarily consume a lot of information. So if I'm if I'm writing an article, I'm like, oh man, I want, I want to really impress Maddie with this, you know what I mean? Like in our head, we might not say that, but we're kind of thinking it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I want to impress the other coaches with how much information I'm putting out, and that's why I'm going to make this article i'm going to reference 50 different research studies and make it 25 pages long your average person that's going to mean nothing to them you yep. know i mean they're not they're going to see that they're going to like oh I ain't, i'm not reading this shit like this is 25 yeah. pages on how to squat like no it's <laughs> bullshit you know what i mean i just want to <laughs> look at something and in five minutes figure out what i need to do yep you and know? that's that's something that i learned over the years of working with clients is that most of them are intimidated by science and intimidated by big words. So are you capable of understanding something so much that you could take all that sciencey shit and break it down to to let someone who doesn't know anything digest it in an easy way? And like that's why I, I really think a great example of this would be Eric Helms. Yep. So he'll create videos on YouTube. The man's a genius. We all yes, know that. Yes. But he will take the most complex topic and break it down so anyone can understand it. And that's something that I keep in mind when I'm working with clients. If you start throwing crazy spreadsheets and calculations at them and all their goal is to do is to lose 10 or 15 pounds in a few months, it's like they're going to get overwhelmed and probably – not lose that 10 or 15 yep. pounds because they don't know what to do anymore so yeah you make it so complicated that they just don't even want to do it anymore then they just yeah. quit and and you're not helping anybody that way but yeah, yeah. That was a, that's it's a really funny. good point i mean to interrupt you but no, now I'm, right. actually coming, I'm thinking about this now so there's the the side of it where you want to break down the complicated stuff and make it simple but if you oversimplify stuff you're not actually teaching them Yep. And that's where another people run into issues. The con Some content creators would be like, it's so easy to track your macros. Just put your food on the scale and throw stuff in there. That's not teaching someone. That's that's showing them what to do, but you're not actually coaching them through it. And that's where we'll talk about – we talked about the coaching thing earlier. But yeah, yeah, and I want to get into that. But you know, that's, a, you, no, but. that's a good point because um, 
And I think that's really what happened with with uh, flexible dieting, and, and more specifically, if it fits your macros, because it was taken really literally, like if mm-hmm. it fits your macros, and people simplified it, simplified it to the point where, okay, hey, all the, nothing else matters besides these three numbers, when we both know that's not necessarily the case, but mm-hmm. it was a fight back, because on the other side of it, people were we're saying everything, every little detail matters about nutrition. You know, your timing and you got to have protein at exactly two hour intervals. And you got to eat eight meals a day and this, this and all this shit. And then the, the flexible dieting, if it fits your macros crowd was like, okay, all right, none of that shit matters. Let's just boil it down to these three numbers. And it was oversimplification. Now, now you could argue that that maybe worked to an extent, but, uh, but no, I really liked your, your point about how people who can take very complex ideas and, and simplify them, but not so much that, you're not teaching because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. you still want to teach. And I think that's really true mastery. Yeah. Yeah. People have, like we said, oversimplified stuff to the point where they, they sound sarcastic when they talk. Yep. So if someone's trying to lose weight and they're a complete beginner and they come to someone who knows a little bit, but not enough to really explain something. What's mm-hmm. their answer? Oh, calorie deficit. Yep. Eat less and move more. That's not helping anyone. Like nope. we get that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I really think that unfortunately, Social media has allowed everyone to have a voice in something that they don't know a lot of stuff about, and they all start throwing their physique around, and yep. their physique really doesn't dictate knowledge, but to some people it does, unfortunately. So when someone is more shredded than the next person but has a quarter of the knowledge, a lot of times they go for that physique. Yeah, a lot of times they do. And, uh, you know, it, it, what's, what's bad about that, it's not even the fact that the people who have really good physiques, it's not that they don't know because obviously they know a, a little bit. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times they get put up on this pedestal because they have a good physique. That means they're all knowing. They know more than anybody else. When the the person who probably has more knowledge but maybe not has the same physique, they're almost like, all right, well, hey, you, you can't do it for yourself or you don't have a good physique, so I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's it's funny. I mean, for, for any anyone listening to this right now, I'm sure you're familiar with Lyle McDonald. Yep. I love the guy. He's another genius. But, like, if someone saw him and then they saw – Oh, Ronnie Coleman, whose advice are they going to take? Yep. I'm talking about a complete beginner who doesn't know anything. Yeah. So you can't you can't just rely on a physique. But at the same time, it's like, yes, they've obviously put in the work. They know enough to get them in shape. But that doesn't mean they have the ability to coach and teach. Yeah. Well, this actually comes back to the whole magazine issue. Because I remember when I first got into fitness, I was reading Flex Magazine, Muscle and Fitness. And, of course, when, when you don't really know anything and you're just getting involved in, in fitness and working out and wanting to improve your physique – Who's, whose program are you going to follow when you're, when yeah. you're flipping through those magazines? The <laughs> dude who's the most fucking jacked, you're going to follow his program. But that's what he's been doing. That's, this is his program after 20 years of training or 15 years of training. And then yeah. you have beginners jumping into, uh, you know, I think that's really where, where bro splits, how they got so popular. Yeah. You know what yep. I mean? Those split routines. Yeah, that's actually funny that you bring that up because going back to magazines, what I used to do was I would flip through the whole magazine so you have – I guess you can call them like bodybuilding freaks where they yeah. were enormous. I mean, you're Ronnie's way back in the day. Yeah. So you would go to the magazine, you would see like Ronnie Coleman, you would see Jay Cutler. And then a couple of pages later, you would see your more like beach physique type guy who was, you know, didn't have that enormous physique. It wasn't too freaky. Yeah. So what we would do is, I don't know if you did this, but I did. I would flip through the magazine and find the physique that I wanted to look like and follow that diet and that training program. Yep. Mm -hmm. So like if Ronnie Coleman had his 3000 calorie diet with all this, and then a couple of pages later, it was just a guy who looked shredded and this was his diet. I'm like, I don't want to look like that guy talking to Ronnie about Ronnie Coleman. Like I want to look like that guy as if that's how easy it is. Oh yeah. Well, you know, taking it a step further, what I used to do would, uh, (laughs) this is funny. So I would look at, I would find the guys like a specific muscle group I would like. So I'd be like, <laughs> so I'd be like, all right, this dude has a awesome back. I'm going to do his back routine. And then I'd find a dude with a, a big chest and I'd be like, I'm going to do his chest routine. <laughs> so I'm really just mixing and matching all these uh, different workouts. Yeah. And it just like, if I did Ronnie Coleman's chest routine, I'm going to have his fucking pecs. <laughs> it's so funny. Cause that's so true, man. That's oh how I, I, I don't know. I'm crying over here, man. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's still like that, though. I really don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's something I would love to honestly survey people with. And I think a lot of people would almost be embarrassed by the answer because I, I know for a fact that people are consuming way more content than they need to. So a lot of times what they'll do also is they'll find someone on YouTube who they can most relate to mm-hmm. and they might follow that person's 
squat or bench press or even try and mimic the way they perform a movement. So nothing is individualized when you're so focused on someone else. And I think that that's why it's so funny that you brought that up because it, it really was like just cherry picking the stuff that you want from yep. different people, from different diets. And it's like maybe all of this together will work for me. Um, yeah. and I, I'm so happy that things have come to where they are right now, where there are people like you and I and a bunch of others out there who are willing to take the time to to educate and tell people like or just be honest with people, I should say. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean. Yeah, it's just, man, I'm, I'm still cracking up about that. <laughs> it's funny because, uh, well, and, and, and the other, another form of that, like the cherry picking of different, I mean, the other form of that is really just cherry picking programs. And you see people do that a lot. And uh, yeah. it really it just ends up in your people spinning their wheels. Like they'll say, well, hey, I like this aspect of this one program, but I also like this other aspect of another program. So then you end up combining two really good programs into one and then it doesn't work. So now you say, yeah. well, both of these programs suck, cause, but you never really did any of them or either one of them. I don't think people understand that word like program. Yeah. Like someone took the time to write that for a specific reason. So if your training intensities are lower, but your frequency is higher, there's a reason for that. Nope. And so someone who's newer might immediately think, I'm not lifting enough weight. I need to go heavier. And now you're totally taken away from the point of the program. Yeah. So everyone's trying to kind of take something from someone else. So someone invested their time and their knowledge into creating this. And now you're going to pick it apart. Like just find something else then. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like to tell my, my clients when we, they just start up with me is I'm like, look, when you're looking at the program, if I wanted you to lift heavier, I would have you lift heavier. If I wanted yeah. you to lift with more frequency or I thought that was better then you'd be doing more frequency. If I thought less frequency was better then you'd be on less frequency. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, anything, there's a reason. There's a reason for everything. Every little yeah. detail, there's a reason for it. And I thought about it and analyzed it and, and customized it to you. And I almost think that maybe people don't understand the word customization either because they're so used to just cookie cutter programs. And they thinking, you know, comparing like, I don't know, like a, a small off squat routine or a Chico or just your average workout program you could get off from bodybuilding.com or whatever website. They think that there's no real difference between that and something completely customized. Because they don't yeah. necessarily understand the nuances. Yeah, and I think it's so it's so weird to to again talk about how where we started to yeah. where things have come now. I mean, you can legit just Google any kind of training program you could think of. Like we didn't really have the ability to do I mean, you could have typed mm -hmm. stuff into Google 10, yeah. 15 years ago, but you're not gonna get the same results you're getting now. I mean, there's a video for every single thing out there. Yeah. I mean I'll be honest, 10 years ago, I wasn't squatting. I wasn't deadlifting. Mm -hmm. Like You might have been. I know you've always been into that, but like... I'm trying to think. Probably. Probably always did. Yeah. Not but, correctly, though. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's, um, like you said, the whole customizing and individualizing stuff to certain people. A legs push-pull is not a program. And that's another thing that people don't understand. Mm -hmm. they, and so many people are again it, this almost goes back to like a relates to the dieting thing with people worried about being a bro you still see people today who are scared to have a training log or mm -hmm. workout log because they don't want to record the numbers but they're still going to the gym lifting the same numbers they lifted five years ago and if people are happy doing that that's fine yeah. like if the gym is just an escape and they just enjoy training cool that's i know people who do that they just yeah. absolutely love being in the gym getting out of the house listening to music and just lifting physical objects that's it they don't care about progressing or building yep. muscle or getting stronger but for the people who do you have to understand that it's it's something that you actually need to work on and track just like everything else yeah exactly and i kind of find myself running into that that same situation because i'm you know constantly putting out information especially to my newsletter just like you know programming and on all this and that and all these details and then eventually i just i come to the point where i'm like all right well, listen everything i just said is for the people asking me questions about how to get better and everyone who's who's really focused on numerical progress now if you are just someone who enjoys going to the gym and just enjoys putting on your headphones and going and lifting and it's more exercise than training then none of this really applies if you're happy if you're happy then just continue doing what you're doing mm -hmm. but if you want to progress don't don't stay on the same type of cookie cutter not even programs or list of exercises don't continue to do that if you want to get better and then wonder why you're not getting better because yeah you know that's this is all that information we just provided is the reason why you're not getting better you're not doing that yep and that's something with every single client that i have 
and I'm sure they can all attest to it, is mm-hmm. every single person that signs up with me, we get on a phone call or a Skype call, and we talk about mm-hmm. everything they want to achieve, mm-hmm. and we make sure that I mean, my first question is, well, my first set of questions when it comes to training is going to be, what's your schedule like? Mm-hmm. You know, your availability. How many days can you realistically go to the gym? I'm not just going to throw a five-day split at you if you can only go three days a week. Yep. What? And this is all my application as well. Do you have any injuries? What can you can't do? What do you prefer? What do you like? I'm not going to throw squats and deadlifts at a 40-year-old who doesn't want to squat and deadlift yep. or who has bad knees or bad back. So that goes back to what we talked about before we even got on the call when we were just chatting back and forth about coaching and coaches and it's yeah. not i mean i've seen unfortunately i've never asked for it, but i've gotten people who come to me for coaching because they were with x coach they weren't happy with them and then they end up linking me screenshots of what their program looked like or what their diet looked like so i'm like this was your coach and all you're sending me this is all i sent you was a one page word document yep. saying monday chest bends three by five that is not coaching someone you know, i always say i'm like if your if your program could be written in the notes section of an iPhone, it's not a program. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me, man. It's it's honestly sad that yeah. anyone who's achieved some kind of half decent physique can call themselves a coach. And you know, yeah. let's get let's get into that a little bit. Let's get into the topic of, of coaching because it's like like we were talking about before we even started the the podcast, that the industry's it's really blown up. I mean, online coaching's huge right now and uh, it's continuing to progress. I mean, all you have to do is Look on, pay attention on social media, and you see everyone saying they're accepting clients. Um, yeah, it's a double-edged sword because I see that. I, I will say that I think there's a, a benefit in the ease of entry in that. When whenever there's more options in the market in a marketplace, so online coaching, we'll say the the market, the better chance you have to finding someone who's right for you. However. Mm-hmm. Whenever you have the ease of entry, there's there's no – you don't have, need any type of qualifications. So with that, you're going to have a ton of people who really have no business helping anybody, and people are going to pay that money, and really they're not going to get anything for it. Yeah. When I, when I talk to people about online coaching, and this could be people not even in the space at all. I mean some friends and family in my personal life just – a lot of them don't get it. They still yeah. don't understand what online coaching is. It's, again, it's very new. So they ask, like, what are you doing all day? Mm-hmm. I, still oh. don't, I still don't think my parents know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is so new. But if you told people you were a personal trainer, they would get that. Mm-hmm. But once you bring in the online aspect, they don't understand because it's not like you're, you're Skyping through their entire workout. Yep. But for the people who are kind of up to date with what, what things that are going on, they, they get it. But um, – uh, what we were saying about how everyone has the ability to coach and they're throwing stuff around and people are able to pick and choose their coach mostly based on, again, like we talked about, the physique that they want or how relatable they are to the person. Mm-hmm. So they watch 200 YouTube channels and they think this guy's funny and he looks good, so I'm going to pay him my money. Yep. Well, and again, the, the issue there comes with with the size of a following. And this is something I've talked about in the past as well, but when whenever someone has a really big following and – they they have a lot of different things going on, and including coaching. You have to wonder how customized the coaching actually is. I mean, because this is what we do for a living. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. That I mean, most of our day is spent sitting in our chair coaching. It's very time consuming. So there's really not. I mean, it's a full time job if you have a full slate of clients. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's it, it just raises questions. Yeah. And, and a lot of people will choose a coach based on the size of their following. Like mm-hmm. They're obviously successful. I'm going to choose them. But like you said, if someone is making a YouTube video and they have a million subscribers and they're talking all day about how they spent hours and hours filming and doing this, you think they're going to be able to sit down with you and coach you? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And again, some people really don't care. Like I think that maybe the younger audience or someone who idolizes a YouTuber – They'll get in shape because they're motivated by that person. Yep. They don't even need them as a coach. Like, let's say, for instance, I you were my ideal physique and I love mm-hmm. watching your videos. I'm just going to kind of follow what you do in your videos. You're going to – just watching you is going to make me train harder, make me eat a little bit better. And I'll get in shape without having to pay you money. Yep. But a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll pay the money because they support that person for whatever reason. They, they enjoy watching their content. And – I don't think it's a matter of them being a good coach if they see results. I think a lot of it is just they were already motivated by watching the person. Now they just, you know, they throw money at them and they can now say so and so is my coach. I'm yeah. working with this person. They feel good about it. It's like this is the most popular person ever. They're my coach and that's why I look like I do or that's how I'm going to get in shape. But take a step back and like 
are they actually your coach or did they just send you a document through email? You know? Yeah, I mean, sometimes people get results in spite of what they do, not because of what they do. Yep. You know, and, and that's a real thing, though. I mean, it, you know, a lot of what we do is really just just geared towards creating progress however we can. And I know we get caught up into the details and the scientific principles and this and that. But, I mean, this has kind of been a, a theme of this this whole podcast. But really, I mean, if you're if you're seeing progress now, now there is an issue because if you're not if you're not training or, or eating with what we would consider um, like sound progress you know sound programs there is going to come a point where you're going to you're going to hit a sticking point like motivation and drive and discipline alone isn't going to carry you through sticking points you know so mm -hmm. you, you still have to have some some principles involved but uh i think just the the big point here is you know at the end of the day you gotta you gotta kind of analyze what you're doing and if you're seeing progress continue with it and if you're not seeing progress then you need to do something different i mean that's kind of what we're what we're saying yeah and you have to be honest with yourself. Yep. People are scared to do that. People are scared to actually take out a sheet of paper, like physical paper and maybe a pen or a pencil yep. and like write down like these are the things I'm doing. These are the things I'm doing wrong. These are the things I'm, I tell my clients this all the time because a lot of times they might hit a plateau or they lose motivation. And it's not more often than not, it's not just because they're not in a deficit. There are there are actual plateaus that a lot of people just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Most people just be like, all right, we're going to drop the calories, increase the cardio. That's not how you – you have to analyze the situation first mm -hmm. and actually talk to your client. So this is for any coaches out there listening who if their client doesn't make progress on the scale for a week and you immediately drop their calories or increase their cardio, did you ask them a few questions about how much sleep they've been getting, about their stress levels? Like all of this stuff is so important. Yep. And I tell my clients that – my overly stressed clients that work really – you know, they have their full-time job. They have a family to take care of. They have kids. They, they're very busy. And – during their check-ins, if they tell me that they had a busy week, I actually ask them, like, were there specific things that stressed you out during mm -hmm. that week? Or take out a sheet of paper and write down, these things are stressing me out. These are the ways I can control them. That is coaching someone. Yes. Not just saying, all right, let's drop the calories, increase the cardio. That's just putting more stress on the body. And you're just going to drive them, literally drive them into the ground. And then your eight weeks expires. Now they gained all that weight back. Yeah, so. I mean, I mean that's the thing. Got to analyze. As a coach, you have to analyze everything. And mm -hmm. there's more to coaching than literally just the X's and O's. And I think a lot of times, especially with with the explosion of online coaching, um, people are just they see it as a, a easy way to make money. And you mm -hmm. can make money doing it. It can be a lucrative career, but it's not going to be easy. I mean, if you're going to be really successful and actually really make change and really inspire clients to, to change their lives and really make this a lifestyle, it's going to have to involve a hell of a lot more than just the X's and O's and, and oh, you're hitting a sticking point. Let's increase cardio or let's decrease your, your carbs, decrease your calories. I mean, there's so much more involved. You have to, you have to actually make it as personal as possible. And which is hard because we might be working with someone across the world. I mean, you might work from, with someone from Australia and you don't really necessarily know what they're doing from a day-to-day -day basis. You just know what they tell you. So you mm -hmm. have to, you kind of almost have to, to dig a little deeper into what, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it is, it's a very good way to make money, but some people just leverage their audience and following and they just look at it like, Hey, if I can make 50 bucks per person and 10,000 people sign up because I have a million followers, that's great money. Yeah. But you're not, yeah, you're just literally just taking money from people and you're not actually helping them through the process. Yeah. So I think the word coach gets thrown around a little too often. Yeah. All right. So let's take a step back and, and talk about YouTube for a second. How did your YouTube channel start? What was your initial motivation in, in starting a YouTube channel? It was a way for me. I guess I called it like a self-improvement uh, mm -hmm. video series. I, I remember making my first, first video, which was horrible. It was absolutely terrible. I was just standing in my kitchen in front of the camera saying how bad I want to motivate people. <laughs> what year was this? Like, was that? What year was this? 2011. 2011, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just standing there. It, it was after I had... I was overweight and then I lost a ton of weight and I wanted to show that transformation and tell people how kind of like the whole, like, if I could do it, you could do it kind of thing. Yeah. And more of it was for me to, to kind of film myself and just watch how I can improve over time. But I, I'll never forget, like, I'm going to admit this. You're probably going to lose some subscribers on YouTube, <laughs> but I was at Planet Fitness. <laughs> I made a, yeah. I made a video or two and it was kind of like your, your typical whatever bro split I was on, but I was actually doing like a voiceover. A lot of people weren't mm -hmm. doing that back then. Like mm -hmm. literally doing a voiceover with some on-screen text about how I was performing the movements. And 
whether it was two or three people that comment and saying like really cool video or I learned thank you for this tip I was like some random stranger who doesn't know who I am found my video took time out of their day to watch it comment on it I was like this could actually be pretty cool like yeah. this can have an impact and this was not, I had nothing no interest in coaching or anything like that I was just going to I was going to college and it was something I enjoyed doing I loved lifting I followed a few channels on YouTube uh this is so many years ago so really wasn't many like youtube mm -hmm. fitness wasn't a big thing vlogging wasn't really a thing and then i made my first bodybuilding grocery haul video where i was just picking up and this was when i was super bro like i actually yeah. i made videos about how i kind of dealt with orthorexia and i was just obsessed with clean eating and everything mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that video to this day i think has like two million views oh, wow. something like that it, it was a horror again another horrible video <laughs> to me in my kitchen like cutting chicken with scissors and showing how to cook it but Every single video I put out, I was getting a few comments on. And then I actually had my phone, I would get a notification every time someone subscribed. So I was like blown away every time one person would subscribe or one person would leave a comment. And I was like, there, if I'm reaching people around the world like this, like there's gotta be more to this. So I just kept putting out more videos and I started reading research and trying to do those informative type videos with whiteboards and PowerPoint slides. And the response was just really good. And I, it, it felt good to actually have an impact on people. and. Here we are five, six years later and yeah. still love doing it. Yeah, I mean, those were the, the good old days of YouTube back when it used to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's still fun. It's just changed. No, it, it is. It, it was it was much more, in my, my opinion, it was much more about helping people and making an impact than what it is now. It's, it's and I have nothing against the fact that it, it's become more about entertainment. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Like, I think it's cool to entertain people if that's what you want to do, but don't pretend that you're there to really help people when you're not yeah well well i think is really just how entertainment has shifted just at like a, a social level i mean well just and think of it this way i mean look at the explosion of netflix i mean netflix is pretty much like like an hbo it's like a it's like a network mm -hmm. now it's not even just i mean i remember back when it was just a i mean you had a subscription and then you would watch like old movies on there you know that was like your only only option you know what i mean and now i mean they have all those netflix specials and they're coming out with like their own movies and uh, all like the best tv shows are tend to be netflix originals and and now with youtube as well it's like it's just it's like filling our space for um for tv like we don't watch tv anymore so now we watch things like netflix and we watch youtube so we watch mm -hmm. these the, the the biggest fitness channels are really just it's, it's really just like a reality show and yeah, I was just going to say I mean? it's reality TV with people that you have the ability to kind of interact with. Yes, that's pretty much like what when it you, is. Like put on, put on MTV Real World. All yep. right, we're not to that extreme with YouTube yet. but That's where it's going. When, yeah, when you watch – if you've watched an episode of that or um, whatever, Jersey Shore, whatever kind of show yep. you're watching on TV, you're seeing people go out. You're seeing them spend money. You're seeing them go to restaurants and hang out with friends. But you never – you never feel a connection with that person because they're not talking to you mm -hmm. as an individual. They're not talking to a camera, to the computer screen and have you, and know that you're sitting in your chair watching it or on your phone watching it. Whereas with YouTube, you know that person's creating content for everyone watching it. It's yeah. very different. It's a lot more personal, but people feel like they can actually relate to it. So that's where it's gone. Like, like we were talking earlier, YouTube has completely shifted to how how can I entertain these people? And then people, unfortunately purposely bring on drama and stuff like that just to gain a bigger audience and bigger following and well yeah I mean, like it, <laughs> it, it's really it's just like i said like we said it's, it's just shifting closer and closer to more like it's reality tv so i'm wondering like what's the next step like is it somehow where youtube has something where it's almost like netflix to where like I mean that's all it is i mean that's pretty much where it's gonna it's gonna get to i think like it's man we're just gonna watch so and so's uh, series like it's like, like we're watching a, a TV show on Netflix. Like we're yeah. not even we're not even going for any type of entertain or information. It's all strictly entertainment. Yeah, and the, and the problem is that entertainment will eventually die out until you start doing extreme things. Yep. So like, look where we are now. I mean, the majority of channels I'm subscribed to have drones. Mm -hmm. Like, who would have ever thought that? A, any normal individual can get their hands on something like that that can fly in the air and shoot 4k and then they can upload that footage to their youtube channel yep. like when you think drones you think secret service you think all this but now your average youtuber has a drone yeah 
So like, what's the next step? Because drones aren't like the far future anymore. They're, it's actually happening it's now. now yeah. Flying thousands of feet in the air, showing them run through a football field or whatever they're doing. So how do you level up? Yeah. Like, like you were saying, in five years, what's going to happen? What's going to be around? Yeah. What, that's what I'm, I'm curious. Like, I'm wondering what it's going to be in, in five years. I mean, I mean, there'll always be a, a spot for people who do want just to do entertainment or I mean, mm-hmm. just education and not strictly entertainment. But, but what's that going to be? It might not be YouTube. It might be a different platform. It might yeah. be more podcasts. I mean, maybe podcasts are, are what's going to get more popular. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, as someone who has been on YouTube for so long and has subscribed to over the course of time, you know, I've unsubscribed from a lot of people, but mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of channels, it, you start to realize, like, I don't have enough time in a day to be watching. I mean, if you're subscribed to 10 people and 10 of them put out a video every other day, mm-hmm. if you have enough time to consume all of that content, I mean, people are putting out, what, 20 minute videos now? Yeah. And I get it. You want to watch your favorite YouTuber and not miss out on anything. But there comes a time where it's like, what about you as an individual? Like, don't you have things that you need to do? Don't you want to better yourself rather than live your life through someone else's YouTube channel? Yeah. Well, it's almost like uh, I kind of say this about Gary Vee's content. Like he puts out so much content and people are consuming it. But a lot of it's like, you know, hustle and work and, and motivation. But when he's saying all that, I'm like, but who's watching the videos? Because people are sitting and watching all these fucking videos. Like, yeah, they can't be hustling and working if you're watching, you know, hour consuming hours of of uh, his shit. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think his strategy is really just to be everywhere oh, yeah. all the time. But it he did it the right way. I mean, he he obviously has a team that helps him out with stuff. But what he's able to do is he he could take a 20 minute video and turn that video into a podcast into a shorter YouTube video, into a Facebook video, into an Instagram post. So he's able to to cut out one segment of his content and distribute it over all these platforms of social media where yeah. it seems like he just created something separate for every single platform. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but, I mean, he, he leverages it great. I'm more talking to like the consumer, like the people who are actually consuming it. It's like, because like you were saying, like, man, if, if you realize that you're you're spending so much time consuming all this information on or all this content on YouTube and and uh, other social media platforms, it's like, man, what are you actually doing in, in your life? Like, what are, yeah, what, are yeah. what actions are you taking? Are you actually taking action on it or just consuming it? Yeah, that's very true. You know? Very easy to read and listen and watch videos about how you should be doing something or how you can be successful, but did you actually take the action Yeah, to, did you to actually do it? do it? Because that's, at the end of the day, that's, what, that's what's most important. Did you yeah. actually, did you do anything? <laughs> yep. And same with same like we can circle back around to just bringing it back to fitness yep. instead of business. You could read about how to get a, a you know a better squat or how to deadlift or how to get abs or whatever. But did you do anything? Did you go to the gym and practice? Did you did you try and track your macro? Like there's so many different things that you can say I know how to do this, but can you actually do it? Yeah, yeah. You know? Um. So what are you doing in your training nowadays? What's that look like? Right now, working with uh, Silent Mike for the last it's been about ten weeks now. Mm-hmm. Ever since my, so I did a physique show in yeah. August, end of August, and two years before that, I've, I've dealt with two lower back injuries, you know, herniated mm-hmm. discs and sciatic pain, all that kind of stuff. Not fun, you know, a few months of not being able to tie my own shoes because oh, of how yeah. bad pain was. So I was always kind of intimidated by the whole squat and bench and deadlift thing, and I had to be very careful my lower back, I'd, mm-hmm. kind of fearing re-injury, and I feel like I've felt 100% for a while. But during prep, I my metabolism just wasn't great. I had to get on really low calories. So yep. I was like, there's no reason for me to kill myself with squats and deadlifts. Now. I'm not growing. Yep. I'm 160 pounds. I'm not going to grow from here. So mm-hmm. after the show, I gave myself some time to, I guess you could say, enjoy the freedom of going into the gym and just training. Like we talked about earlier, you know, some people just like to go there and train. And that's the mindset I was in at that time. Mm-hmm. I was trying to do a little bit of traveling. So I didn't want to stick to any structured program. But over the last few months, I decided like, this is the time where I want to dedicate myself to an actual program with someone who's extremely knowledgeable. And people ask me, if you're a coach, why do you have a coach? I get that all the time. Even for mm-hmm. my prep, I worked with Jeff Nippard. People are like, you coach people to get in shape or you coach people to get on stage. So why do you need to coach yourself? And I don't think people understand how easy it is to get in your own head. And when yep. you have to, when you could take all that stress out of your head and really what you're doing is you're putting it on someone else. That's their job is to, is to do all this work for you. I always give you the groundwork and then you just have to go in and follow the plan. Yep. Um, 
so that's what I wanted to do. Like I know I can program for squat, bench, and dead. I can read on how to do it. There's plenty of, you know, whether you want to get into evidence or not, but there's articles, there's YouTube videos mm-hmm. about how to program for these lifts. But I enjoy having someone to talk to. I enjoy getting feedback from someone. I enjoy reporting back to someone. I just I think it's extremely important. Yeah, I actually just wrote an article about this. It's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> I wrote an article. I titled it The Case for Hiring a Fitness Coach. And one of the things I said in there, I, I said straight up, I go, here's the – I don't want to say the dirty secret, but the dirty secret of the fitness industry is all your favorite fitness professionals all have all have or have had coaches in the past mm-hmm. because we understand the value of a coach. It would, yep. it's, it's it's really hard to to trust somebody who's who's offering coaching, but then they don't necessarily act on it and see the value in coaching for themselves. Yeah. You know, whenever we've done anything or been successful at anything in our entire life, we've had someone helping us, whether it's when we were in school, whether it's when we were playing sports as a kid, we needed help in a specific subject in school, so we get a tutor. Like, we get coaches. We get people to help us. But then when we become adults, it's like, oh, we can handle it. We can do it all ourselves. Yeah. And, and really, when you hire a coach, it just – this is what I tell my clients as well. It fast-tracks your progress. You might be able to do it on yourself. Now, mind you, whenever you have a big goal, whether it's competing in a physique show, doing a powerlifting competition, whenever it's a big goal, a lot of times you're going to get in your own head, and it's going to yep. be very easy – to doubt yourself. It's like, oh man, did I, did I calculate my percentages wrong? Am I eating too much? Do I need to reduce my, my calories? Do I need to go low carb? Should I go a low fat? Like keto? What sh- intermittent fat? Like, you know what I mean? Just just take all that responsibility and give it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier. Yeah. And and that it's so funny because I feel like everything that we talk about now with your reference to what we talked about earlier yep. about the people afraid to admit that they eat a certain way because they're not flexible enough. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like it's the same thing with people hiring coaches, they're almost afraid to say this person helped me because they want to say they did law on their own. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I learned. I mean, I'm going to be 30 this year. So probably Mm -hmm. older than maybe your average listener. I'm not sure what the Mm -hmm. audience is, but even for probably the people who follow me on YouTube, Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as demographics go, you're looking at 18 to 24, but Mm -hmm. someone's going to be 30. Like my priority is being able to support myself and my wife and, you know, have a place to live and make sure that we are taken care of and I can take care of my family and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I've I've hired business coaches in the past because I need to know how to run my business more efficiently. There are people who are better than me at this. Yep. It doesn't matter how good you are at something. There's always someone who's better. Yes. So I've never – and I've been scared in the past to actually take that step and invest into – because I'm like, the information's out there. Mm-hmm. Anything in the world that you want to know, you can just go on Google and you'll find the answer. But you'll find 10,000 answers and now you're going to sit there for probably months – and months contemplating like which direction should I follow? Who should I follow? Whose advice is right? Just go to someone who's done it before, who's better than you at it and who could teach you. Yes. You just got to just follow a method. And then maybe at the end of that time, you may, you may realize this wasn't exactly for me, but I learned a lot yes. in the process. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to invest in yourself. Actually, yep. there was a, a great book that I just read. Um, it's called the La- the last safe investment. Have you heard of it? No. Yeah, so I highly recommend it. I think you would really like it. But, it's, yeah, it's titled The Last Safe Investment. And really what the – I mean, it's, it goes into a lot of different things. But really the, the general theme of the book is the, the only safe investment that there is is investing in yourself, investing mm-hmm. in your relationships, investing in your knowledge, investing in your skills. And that's what you're doing when you're hiring a coach. You're not yep. just you're not just hiring the coach for – like from a fitness perspective, just the like, – like we've said earlier, the X's and O's. From a business perspective, you're not just hiring a coach for – there are systems you're hiring to learn. You're hiring to learn and become a, a better person and, and just improve your as in personal development. Yeah. I would say that m- the majority of the time, if you're coaching someone for whether it's 12 weeks or 24 weeks or even a year, I mean, I've had some people who, who stick with me for like two years yeah. plus. Mm-hmm. And I know for a fact that I've given them the tools they need to succeed on their own, but they still just enjoy that client coach relationship and they like to have someone to report back to and they like to you know, they, again, they get in their own head. Things happen. Like life isn't just a smooth sailing path. Like mm-hmm. everything just goes right. So when things go wrong, they like to have that person to come back to and like, all right, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't think a lot of people are like you said, investing in themselves like they should be. There's yeah. too worried about what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And, and they're not worried about themselves enough. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, but then again, they might just be, you know, a lot of people hate to admit that they needed help. Yeah. You know? They just they just hate to admit. So you're working with Silent Mike. Are you doing more powerlifting stuff? Yeah. Work, so right now stronger. 
he's programming the big three and pretty much giving me free reign on the accessory type stuff because mm-hmm. he understands that like that's that's what I enjoy. So yeah, yeah. I do enjoy you know heavier lifting, powerlifting style training, but. I'm one of those people who like I'll be in there for an hour and a half just volume training and I'm still tracking it to make yeah. sure I'm progressing, but it's just mm-hmm. something I love. And I guess I don't like to use like the, the hype words like I'm a power builder or I'm like it's just like I enjoy different styles of yes. training. So I want to get stronger in the squat bench and deadlift. Like that's something that's important to me. Mm-hmm. But my physique is important to me as well. So I like to make sure that I'm getting proper um, volume in. Mm-hmm. After my recent show, dieting down was a really big wake up call to like what my weak points were. So that's where I'm kind of dedicating those accessory movements yep. to. And yeah, he's just been helping me. We just uh, we just started a new block. And again, it's it's lower intensities and more frequency and volume. And there are times where I actually go into the gym and I'm like, this is this is light. Like I want to mm-hmm. go up and wait. And I'm like, Silent Mike is in my head, like, don't do that, bro. Like this is the program. We're gonna follow it. Yeah. You know, back to basics, building up the work capacity. And that's so important that again, if you're working with someone and they know what they're doing, just follow what they say because there's a reason for it. Yes, that's that's huge. I mean, I've had I've had clients do that as well. They're like, man, Kyle. Like power often clients, man, Kyle, this, this seems light. I'm like, I know, I know. Just trust me. We're <laughs> we're laying the foundation. We're building up your work capacity. The heavy, yeah. trust me, the heavy stuff will come. It's almost like when you start a, a competition diet in like the first month that you're not completely suffering like terribly. And people yeah. are like, shouldn't I be like feel like feeling like death right now? No, there'll be a time for that. But right now we're just slowly. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're gonna it. wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's that's the other thing. You know, a lot of people have that kind of all or nothing approach or the extreme of treating training like like war or like battle yeah. like if you don't if you weren't in the gym for two hours and you your shirt's not drenched and you're not sore for a week that you didn't work hard enough yep you know and those aren't really indicators of progress or and, well and, it's like looking at workouts in an individual basis so how hard did i go today how tired did i feel today and needing to feel completely exhausted at the end of your workout to feel like you had a good workout. When in reality, training is about the commu- – like training is more about the effect, the long-term effect. So week to week, month to month than it is yep. of any given workout. So one workout is just a drop in the hat of your long-term mm-hmm. progress. And every single workout does not have to feel like – you can't do anything else that day. And it you know, shouldn't. And it shouldn't feel like – actually, it shouldn't yeah. feel like that. I mean if it does feel like that – Generally speaking, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot, I think that the whole idea came from, again, keeps coming back to the same things, but people following programs, quote unquote programs that are really just a list of exercises. So they have no built in progression and nothing to actually gauge progress or not even to facilitate progress. So the only way to facilitate progress on a list of exercises is just to go as hard as possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and people are, a lot of people lack self-awareness when it comes to this. So <laughs> they'll do that all or nothing thing. They'll go hard for two days, three days. And then the next day they feel absolutely drained. And now they'll actually start blaming it on things like their calories are too low or they didn't get enough sleep when maybe sleep and calories were on point, but you absolutely destroyed your central nervous system and you're completely fatigued because mm-hmm. you tried to go all out every single session. Like that's how I feel like. When I was not following a program, there were some days where I just – I went in and the volume that I did shouldn't even be done by humans. It was just yeah. like <laughs> I just had my headphones and I just kept going, going, going. And the next day I woke up and I felt like legit exhausted. Yeah. And some people aren't able to actually distinguish the difference between I kicked yesterday's workout's ass and that's why I'm so tired because I, I won yesterday mm-hmm. or I absolutely drove myself into the ground and my body is like struggling. Yep. Mm-hmm. You got to be able to understand the difference between the two. Well, yeah, because I mean, you can only make progress on what you can recover from. So exactly. There's, yeah. there's no sense in going above and beyond than what you can recover from, because I mean, you're really just taking taking longer recover, and, that, and that's kind of the issue with the traditional style of training of of a limited frequency. So, say you have Monday chest day, you just absolutely crush your chest, but then you can't train your chest again for a week. I mean, because mm-hmm. I mean, you're just destroyed. Now, why don't we take a couple steps back and then we can hit it a couple times a week? You know, I mean, that's kind yeah. of the idea there. Yeah, it's the same with, you know, people save, people will tend to favor their better body parts yep. and they'll hit them in the beginning of the workouts with all the intensity. And it's like, all right, so if your biceps are lagging and you train biceps on back day and you just did 30 sets of back workouts as heavy as you can, 
how strong do you think your biceps are going to be at the end of that workout? Yep. So instead, what do you do? You throw them in. You do three sets of 10 with curls. What if you started with biceps or what if you did a separate day for biceps or threw them in on a leg day? Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. just different things like that where you can actually prioritize your weak points. But no one ever wants to work on their weak points because they're weak and it sucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one wants to, no one wants to do – I mean that, that kind of goes back to the idea of why coaching is so beneficial because when you're coaching yourself or designing your own programs or your own workouts and nutrition, you're going to do things that you're good at. I mean it's yep. just human nature. I mean you're – like for me, for example, with powerlifting, when I'm doing my own programming, I find it very easily that I want to skimp on deadlifts because I just don't like deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to skimp on bench press. Like I'm going to throw an yeah. extra bench press because I, I fucking love to bench. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, sometimes like when I'm getting ready for a meet, it's like, all right, I, I, I need to get a coach because I need – because if I'm following a program, even – now, mind you, if I'm writing my own program, then I'll follow it because I, I know the benefits. But just the mental aspect of – I almost second guess myself with certain things because it's I just don't want to do it. You know, we're yeah. human. You know, we just. It's so funny because and, and you can go back to the thing that every single person jokes about is like team no calves. Yep. But it's like if you don't have calf, like the first person to say like my calves are lagging, my traps are lagging, my rear delts are lagging. The first question I'm going to ask is, oh, how often do you train them? Yep. <laughs> Um, you know, I got to throw them in here and there. <laughs> it's like, well, that's why they're lagging. So like, don't blame your genetics right away. Yep. Like, sure. There are some, you know, genetics are going to play a huge role in, in shape and structure, um, muscle bellies, all of that. But how hard did you work or how often did you train them or how consistently have you trained them? I think again, it goes back to like the self-awareness and being honest with yourself. Yeah, you have to, you have to. And, and kind of using myself as an example, it's like, okay, well maybe I am doing the same amount of, or an adequate amount of volume on, on the deadlift, but am I really focusing on it? Am I, am I doing extra because it's a, the weakest of my three lifts? Am I, you know what I mean? All these little things. It's yeah. It's so important. Yeah. So I mean, that happens though from time to time. If yep. there's a lift that you don't enjoy, it's let's see how fast I can get over with this. And then yep. you severely decrease your rest times and it's yep. just like I just want to get done. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like or... for for instance, if you had if you had seven sets of three on something, you do your first three sets and you're like, yeah, maybe I'll do like a set of twelve. I'll yeah. just knock all these into, <laughs> into one set. I've done that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so have I. That's why I put love. <laughs> but, yep. but like now, if, if progress stalls because of that, you have to be honest with like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe yep. I should have took extra rest time. And it's, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's all fun though. You know, it's, if you can, if you can actually admit to these things like we are right now, yeah. then th I think that's what's important because we know like if you're doing something wrong and you start blaming other stuff for it and never blaming yourself, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Yep, exactly. But if, well, if you're not progressing and you can admit that it's because of this, like I'm aware that this is why I'm not progressing and. I choose not to fix it, then that's a completely different. Yeah, it's completely you know. different because when you're when you're making excuses, really what you're doing is you're saying your progress or your improvement is out of your control. You're yeah. saying you're you're deferring responsibility. You're saying whatever my excuse is is the reason why I can't be successful. Whereas yeah. that's completely different than saying than than recognizing, hey, I did that. That's the reason why I'm not successful. It's not because yeah my genetics it's not because the gym doesn't have this equipment it's not because whatever it was because i skimped on the workout i didn't put in the work or yeah. i slept two hours last night or mm -hmm. i went out instead of you know going in early and sleeping and getting extra hours i didn't i missed a couple meals and i went out and party you know what i mean like that's the reason yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm huge on Damn, what are we on, like two hours? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we got to finish this up. <laughs> all right. Well, I just, <laughs> this is actually a good way to wrap it up because we're talking about all these, like, honesty things, self-awareness mm -hmm. things. I'm very big on writing how I feel throughout the day, yeah. whether that whether you want to use a phone or a piece of paper or whatever, or even at the end of the day, you kind of just collect all your thoughts and just get stuff down on paper so you can kind of revisit it and take a look at it. And I'm really big on that because I think it's important to not just rely on, like, guessing why something mm -hmm. went wrong. Like if you if you got two hours of sleep, maybe you actually forgot that you got two hours of sleep and you had a shitty workout and you're blaming it on your headphones dying or yep. you were just in a bad mood. But it might be because you got that two hours of sleep. Or for some people who have the best workout of their life, like let's say they're, they're doing back and every single time they did a row, they actually felt their back contract, which they don't mm -hmm. feel very often. Did you take note of why that's happening? Mm -hmm. Like it could be something as stupid as the seat height on the machine that you were on. How often do people go into the gym and like they just they just throw the seat anywhere and they yeah, start yeah. 
you go to the hammer strength machine, they, they throw the seed somewhere and they start pulling, but they're not really feeling it like they want to. Mm-hmm. And then they remember back to that session where it's like, why am I not feeling it like I did that one day? Well, you should have took note of why it felt so good at that time and try and replicate that over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I just think there's a huge benefit in in tracking a lot of stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I, I physically take a composition notebook into the gym with me so I can write notes because I just think it's easier. I mean, yeah, there's 100 apps that you could use, but I just like the idea of a pen and paper and I can write down some notes. Um, another huge thing I started actually just this year is a uh, the five-minute journal. Have you ever seen this? Oh, thing? okay. I, yeah, I've never actually like looked through it, but uh-huh. but yeah, it's kind of like you, you write a couple minutes in the morning, a couple minutes at, at night. It's more like gratitude type things, but you set goals for your day, and then you reflect on what was great, what, what great things happened during the day. But just like again, kind of the idea of so you can remember certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah. That because you forget. Yeah, so, I mean, I, because it just goes back to all the content that's available to us. Yeah. We get so consumed in that we forget about ourselves and like what's happening in our life. Yeah. So just to wrap this up, if you could go back to when you first started started this whole fitness journey what were you like 17 18 what uh yeah. what piece of advice would you give yourself Ooh, that's a good one mm-hmm. does, does youtube and everything exist yeah yeah <laughs> everything exists everything exists. okay um more so focusing on myself okay. I, I got i got really wrapped up in what other people were doing mm-hmm. and i see that to this day and i'm not going to sit here and lie like there are some days where i'm like why can't I look at that? Why can't I be as strong as this person? And it's like thinking with that mindset is never going to get me there. Yep. So if I can go back, I would just, I would be a lot more, again, self-aware and honest with myself, you yeah. know, um, spend more time learning and less time trying to, like we were talking about cherry picking. Yep. I, I wouldn't be subscribed to 200 youtube channels and making sure that i watched every single one because i needed to hear what everyone had to say yeah i would invest more into myself i guess that that's a simple way to yeah. put it okay i'll just invest more into myself like whether that be time whether that be um being more grateful of certain things i think that's uh that's important awesome dude well hey man this has been an awesome episode i've really enjoyed it yeah this was great man i know we went off on a few tangents but i really think we covered we covered a lot you know we yeah covered i think so coaching, we covered we covered business we covered just living life and worrying about yourself and yeah it was definitely uh this is fun it it, it was definitely fun so uh (laughs) how can people find more information about you uh pretty much on all social media just maddie fusaro i'm usually on you know snapchat twitter instagram facebook youtube um website's getting redone it's fusarofitness.com which is still available right now Mm -hmm. but i am working on a new website um coaching services all getting revamped but yeah that's that's pretty much all social media, I'm always around. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put uh, your social media links in the description box. Awesome. The video Thank you, man. And, uh, show notes. All right, man. Well, hey, Good. it was a great time, and uh, we'll have to catch up again here soon. Yes, absolutely, man.